Hello everybody and welcome to this video. It's the continuation in my series on Pride and Prejudice. Everything I go through in this video comes from Mr. Bruff's Guide to Pride and Prejudice, which is available at mrbruff.com. It's the complete novel alongside my detailed analysis and it's exclusive to mrbruff.com. So, what I want to talk about today is the importance of the title, Pride and Prejudice. Now, the novel was originally going to be called First Impressions, and that's when it was submitted for publication in 1797. But, of course, the novel wasn't published until 1811, and by that time there were two other novels which had been published uh, with the title First Impressions. So Austen changed her title to Pride and Prejudice, which was a well-known saying at the time, supposedly based on the novel Cecilia, by the writer Francis Burney. Now, Cecilia tells the tale of a heroine who can only inherit her uncle's wealth if she persuades a man to take her surname. And the line which Austen seems to borrow from the title, oh sorry, to borrow her title from, is spoken by Dr. Leicester when he exclaims, the whole of this unfortunate business has been the result of pride and prejudice. So there are clear similarities between the two novels in that they both focus on love, marriage, wealth, and a patriarchal, male-dominated society. However, the title is also interwoven into the plot of the novel as well. Before we go any further, let's have a think about what these two uh, seemingly quite similar words mean. So pride is the feeling that you're more important than others, and prejudice is where you have a bad opinion of someone or something before even meeting them or experiencing the subject. So on first reading, the novel leads the reader to believe that the interpretation of the title is simple. Mr. Darcy is proud, Elizabeth Bennet is prejudiced. However, there is more to it than that. Let's examine the relevant quotations in chronological order. The first mention of pride comes in chapter five in discussion of Mr. Darcy, where Jane explains that everybody says he is eaten up with pride and it's Miss Lucas who replies that his pride does not offend me so much as pride often does because there's an excuse for it and Miss Lucas then goes on to explain that Darcy has every right to be proud as he is rich and successful in life and then after that Mary says that pride is a very common failing I believe by all that I have ever read I am convinced it is very common indeed that human nature is particularly prone to it, and there are very few of us who do not cherish a feeling of self-complacency on the score of some quality or other, real or imaginary. Vanity and pride are different things, though the words are often used synonymously. A person may be proud without being vain. Pride relates more to our opinion of ourselves, vanity to what we would have others think of us. Now Mary's words here are significant. Everyone suffers with pride. It seems Mary is being used to explain Austen's own views. And the narrator adds comic effect when just before Mary's definition, we read that Mary piqued herself upon the, solid the solidity of her reflections. Now, piqued may be an unfamiliar word to modern readers, but we can read it as excited. In other words, she's proud of her own thoughts uh, on the topic of pride. Darcy's pride is evident at the first ball, where he argues that Elizabeth is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. Now clearly Darcy sees Elizabeth as beneath him in this comment, and he is indeed acting in a very prideful manner. It's not just Elizabeth who writes off Mr Darcy, society does that too. When the narrator explains his character was decided, he was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped he would not come there again. Now, the fact that the narrator is here used to summarise the feelings of everyone is Austen's way of criticising just how prejudiced society was. If it was only Elizabeth who felt that way, we might wrongly assume that she's alone uh, in that assumption. Um, but with the narrator making it clear that everyone felt the same way, the piece becomes a work of social criticism. So what can we say up to this point? Mr Darcy seems to be proud, Miss Lucas excuses it as justified, and Mary explains that all are proud in some areas. 
Now let's look at the next mention of the topic. We see an example of Elizabeth's prejudice in chapter 10. Having written him off as a proud man, uh, Elizabeth misconstrues Darcy's offer to dance. Oh, said she, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated content, premeditated contempt. I have therefore made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. So here we see that Elizabeth is incorrect in her judgment. She believes Darcy's asked her to dance merely to be able to mock her in her reply. But the reader knows that's not true. Darcy's falling in love with Elizabeth. And this is an example of dramatic irony where the reader knows something that the character on the page does not. And perhaps our opinion of Darcy changes here. We can't help but be a bit sorry for him. Now, not only does Elizabeth incorrectly write off a good man as bad, but she does the exact opposite when meeting Mr Wickham in chapter 16. When Wickham tells Elizabeth his tale of being poorly treated at the hands of Darcy, she is uh, disgusted and she can't believe that it could happen to a young man too, like you, whose very countenance may vouch for you being amiable. What does this mean? Well, Elizabeth is saying Mr Wickham's appearance proves his goodness. In other words, she's prejudiced to think a certain way of him purely by how he looks and presents himself. Unfortunately, it gets worse. Later on in the chapter, Elizabeth writes off Lady Catherine de Bourgh as an arrogant, conceited woman. And that's the very definition of prejudice, to form a bad opinion of someone before even meeting them. So at this point, it's clear that Darcy is proud and Elizabeth is prejudiced. Darcy seems to think himself above the company he keeps. Elizabeth forms instant judgments on people, whether she's met them or not. However, there are also some examples of pride in Elizabeth and prejudice in Mr Darcy. When Elizabeth rejects Darcy's marriage proposal in chapter 34, he accuses her that these offences might have been overlooked, uh, but had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples that had long prevented my forming any serious design. In other words, Elizabeth is proud of herself and this proud attitude is hurt when Darcy challenges the opinion she holds. And the happy ending of the novel, when the marriage of Elizabeth and Darcy takes place, causes both to reflect on their own weaknesses. In chapter 36, Elizabeth recognises herself as I who have prided myself on my discernment. And here we can see that she has pride or had pride in her ability to insightfully judge others. In essence, Elizabeth is admitting both pride and prejudice, and Darcy is quickly um, up to do the same in chapter 58 as you can see on the screen here as a child I was taught what was right but I was not taught to correct my temper I was given good principles but left to follow them in pride and conceit unfortunately an only son for many years an only child I was spoilt by my parents who though good themselves my father particularly all that was benevolent and amiable allowed encouraged almost taught me to be selfish and overbearing to care for none beyond my own family circle, to think meanly of all the rest of the world, to wish at least to think meanly of their sense and worth compared with my own. Such I was from eight to eight and twenty, and such I might still have been, but for you, dearest and loveliest Elizabeth, what do I now not what do I not owe you? You taught me a lesson hard indeed at first, but most advantageous. By you I was properly humbled. I came to you without a doubt of my reception, you showed me how insufficient were all my pretensions to please a woman. So once again, we see both pride and prejudice here. Darcy's pride is evident in the sense that he felt himself superior after being spoilt. His prejudice comes into play when he felt meanly of all the rest of the world. In other words, he prejudged everyone in a negative light before even meeting them. And in this way, Elizabeth and Darcy both exhibit pride and prejudice to others. Their coming together at the end of the novel causes them to reflect on their mistakes and hopefully avoid them in the future. In terms of social criticism then, Darcy and Elizabeth act in a symbolic sense to represent how society can only flourish if it rids itself of both pride and prejudice. There's a strong link to the author's own life here, remember, 
Austin lost the man she loved because of his parents' pride and prejudice, and perhaps this is a major theme of the whole novel. Society must rid itself of self-importance and judgmental attitudes.